Happy Mother's Day and welcome to Prodigal Church. We are so grateful for all of the women in our lives and today is all about you. You are our main squeeze and we've got some tasty beverages on your way out so be sure to stop by and pick up your gift. Being a mom is so great. We have these kids that we get to worry and stress about every single day. Are they feeling okay? Is the kid next to them feeling okay? Were they absent? Does that mean we're gonna get sick? Do they have everything they need? Are they signed up for sports? Are they signed up for dance? Are they being nice? Are people being nice to them? Every single thing about their life, we worry and we stress about and we plan for, but it's all worth it because at the end of the day, after I've thought about it, worked, worried all day to hear the words, mom, when will dad be home? Or mom, is dad almost home? Can you look and see where dad's at on the phone? Or mom, no, I don't wanna go with you to Target. I'd rather stay with dad. And then, you know, it makes it all worth it. You know, he knows for sure. Cause he, he, he gets it, right? I get it. Yeah. I get it. We are in week two of our sermon series, Her the power, influence, and impact of women in scripture. Today, we'll be looking at the most famous queen in the Bible, Queen... Elizabeth. No, no, Queen... Elsa. Esther. 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 Right. Queen Esther. Okay. <laughs> it's a tiny hat. Wow. Okay. Next Sunday is our annual Prodigal Family Barbecue at Woodward Park. We'll have food, fun and games for the whole family. And this is a free event, so invite everybody you know. We can't wait. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody in the club. Registration has begun for our PC Kids Summer Camp. It's from 9 a.m. to noon, July 10th through the 13th, here at Bowling. It's four days of jam-packed fun and excitement for all kids ages 5 to 12. You can sign up now on our app or our website. Attention, all teens and young adults. Our summer internship program is filling up and this is the last week to apply. This is a paid internship that will help not only our church, but also the intern themselves. You can apply on our app or our website. <laughs> you can download our Prodigal app for free at your app store. It's the best way to stay connected to all things Prodigal. And if you'd like to give to Prodigal Church, there are three ways you can do so. You can use the giving boxes on your way out, the giving kiosk in the foyer, or give online at prodigalchurchfresno.com. We so appreciate your generosity. It makes a huge difference. Thanks again for joining us at Prodigal Church. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Mom. Mom! I say we do those last ones one more time. The app. We are so grateful for all of the women in our lives, and today is about you. <laughs> I don't even know what it was. I did like about you, but yeah. it's weird. But we're rewarded because it's, it net when. Because I talked before. I don't know, I know. At the most famous queen in the Bible, Queen Esther. <laughs> Attention, all <laughs> teens. Scare you? No, but I was acting. Jump scare. Okay. Attention, all teens and young adults. Attention, all teens and young adults. Our. <laughs> Like that. That's fine. Their clothes or their sports, like equipment, everything that they have. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Growing up as a woman in the church was a huge part of my life experiences that shaped me into the woman I am today. And whether or not I knew it at the time, it was molding me and making a difference in my life. I did have women role models in my life that made a positive impact on me. And they were leaders in certain capacities, but there was always a caveat of boundaries and walls that they needed to remain within in order to fit the status quo of what the expectations were for a woman. And I, I saw that and I couldn't not see that. 
Women were not the leaders per se, but they were under the leadership of a man in almost every situation. For example, women are to be the children's ministry directors and men are to preach. Women are emotionally unstable and unreliable and men are sound decision makers. Women are soft-spoken and men's word carries more authority. But women are certainly not the lead pastor. I distinctly remember seeing women, if they wanted to speak up or say something, tapping on their husband's shoulder or a male shoulder in order to imply that they needed the permission to speak or to say something in order to have his blessing. My first time working for a church, my title was the children's director, and that didn't ruffle any feathers. It didn't ruffle my own feathers, but I remember the first time I was referred to as a pastor, it made me feel very uncomfortable. I didn't feel like I was qualified to carry that title. It wasn't a hers title, it was a him, it was a his title, and I was so uncomfortable with it. It took a lot of encouragement and time and reflection in order for me to settle with the fact that what I was doing was pastoral care, it was pastoral ministry, and that wasn't an easy thing to come to personally. It is not uncommon to walk into a space uh, full of pastors and to be the only female who carries that title. And at first it was really uncomfortable I didn't feel like I should speak up or that I should say anything, but if I did, I needed to make sure that I was articulate and that I was confident in what I had to say. Otherwise, it would almost reinforce the feeling that they, that I thought they were thinking of me, which is that I didn't belong in that space. Throughout my years as a woman working in ministry, my confidence in myself and who God has created me to be are not the same as they used to be. I'm excited for my daughters, my two beautiful daughters, to be able to grow up uh, seeing their mom live into who God created her to be, and hopefully that that would translate to them being able to do the same in their own lives, even if that is them being a bold, strong, fierce woman, and that they can make a difference in this world in the way that God created them to. I am grateful for and embracing how God created me, and I am hopeful for my girls. Well, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we have so many amazing moms in our church, and I have so many amazing moms in my life. My mother-in-law, Billy, um, is hands down the best mother-in-law in the world. Uh, my own mom has been my biggest fan my entire life. And then Sarah, uh, Dex and Ivy are so lucky to have you as their mom and it has been so fun raising kids with you. Welcome to week two of our sermon series, Her, The Power, Influence, and Impact of Women in Scripture. This morning, we're going to be exploring the story of Esther. Also, there's some audience participation. Now, I know those of you who are watching this online, uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, but just play along, trust me, okay? The story of Esther is remembered by the Jewish community each year at the holiday of Purim. And whenever the story is told on Purim, their local synagogue, there's audience participation. Whenever the storyteller says the name Mordecai, everybody cheers loudly, and he's one of the story's heroes. Whenever the storyteller says the name Haman, everybody boos loudly. Okay, he's the villain in the story. Uh, some synagogues also kind of turn this into a drinking game, but we are going to stick to the cheers and the booze. Now, we're not going to do this every time I say the names Haman and Mordecai. Things can get out of hand, but we will do it at times. So whenever I say Mordecai and you see his name appear on the screen, I want you to cheer. I want you to go crazy. And whenever I say the name Haman and it comes on the screen, I want you to boo, okay? Let's try this out. There's this guy named Mordecai. Then there's this bad guy named Haman. Okay, you got this. Okay, again, it's only when the names are on the screen. So if you're just listening on a podcast right now, this is not going to be very helpful. Okay, to begin, the year was 481 BC. 
The Jewish people have been removed from their homeland for over 100 years, and Persia is the ruling empire of the time. The king is Xerxes. And he's not just the king of Persia, but of most of the known world in the time. Xerxes was impulsive, narcissistic, and had more power than anyone on earth. His wife was a beautiful woman named Vashti. He was the envy of all the men of the kingdom, and she was the envy of all the women. Our story begins with Xerxes throwing a massive party for all the rich and elite in his kingdom, and the party lasts 180 days. The Persian kings believed that the gods would give them strategies for military conquest when they were drunk, and so they were drunk often. And after the 180-day rager, the king decides the party wasn't enough, so he throws another seven-day party. On the last day of this party, Xerxes invites his wife, Queen Vashti, to come to the party so that he can show off her vast beauty to all the drunken elite. She refuses. She was invited to be demeaned and disrobed by the most powerful man in the world, and she said no. This is meant to be subversive. It's also meant to be funny. Here, this king controls 127 provinces around the world, and he cannot control the heart of one human being. Though it may cost her her crown and her life, she refuses. She would lose her dignity or lose her life, and she chooses the latter. This queen had no real power except the power of refusal, and she wielded it well. And this sent Xerxes into a rage. This Vashti event, this refusing, this small event has absolutely astounding ramifications. Her refusal was the first drop into something so much bigger. You see, we never quite know the impact of our own decisions. You will never know the full effects of the decisions you make. In the book of Esther is a reminder that big doors swing on small hinges. It's these little life decisions in life that shape our futures, that change our trajectories. It's not always the life-altering decisions that are life-altering. It is often the small, non-life-altering decisions that become life-altering. Big doors swing on small hinges. So make each small decision well. So there's this beauty pageant throughout the empire to replace Vashti as queen. And it is at this point in the story where we meet Mordecai. Mordecai had a cousin named Esther whom he had raised because she had neither father nor mother. And Esther enters this beauty pageant. But before she leaves, Mordecai insists that she does not reveal her Jewish identity. Now, we don't know why he asked her to do this, but she honors his request. She doesn't reveal that she's Jewish. Now, Esther was more pleasing to the king than any other woman, and immediately a crown was placed on her head. This orphan Jewish girl was queen of the known world, of the Persian Empire. Xerxes, of course, then threw another party. And all this time, Esther hid from everyone her Jewish identity. Now, we know that in Esther chapter 1, it was the third year of King Xerxes. But we discover in Esther chapter 2 that Esther was taken into the royal residence in the seventh year of King Xerxes. That means that there is a, there's four years from Esther 1 to Esther 2. It's been four years, four years since Vashti. Not only that, but she has a full year of preparation before she even met King Xerxes. Some of you have been waiting on a dream, and now it's been a year. It's been two years. And you might begin to think, well, I guess it wasn't real. I guess it wasn't supposed to be. But don't you know that the bigger the promise, the more time you have to wait? Time doesn't disqualify the promises of God. It validates them. It takes patience. And patience isn't just waiting. Patience is waiting with the right attitude. You're going to wait one way or the other. And the question is, will you be patient while you wait? And will you choose the right spirit 
in every season, whether you are prospering or in lack or on the mountaintop or in the valley. Live like God is already doing what you're waiting for. Esther, she wasn't twiddling her thumbs and then all of a sudden she became queen. So many times in our lives, we think that once we get what we've been praying for, then we'll get things right. Some of us are like, well, I'm gonna have peace once I finally get married. No, you won't. I'm gonna have confidence once they promote me at work. No, you won't. I will live on mission once I graduate college. No, you won't. I will speak faith once I get that miracle. Well, that's the opposite of faith. You should be living like God is already doing what you're waiting for. Look at Esther. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. If we're expectant of God to open up opportunities in our lives, then we'll be ready when we hear the knocking. The beauty of Esther is she was living like a queen before she became a queen. She didn't wait to be royal. She was royal all along. She was a royal orphan slave. Because outward beauty, that can change, but the inner beauty of Esther had been cultivated her entire life. Now, back to the story. Mordecai is an official at the king's gate, and he overheard two guards talking to each other, and these guards had unique access to the king, and they were talking about a, an assassination attempt. Xerxes had done something that made them very angry and they wanted him dead. Mordecai hears of this, tells Queen Esther, and then the assassination plans are foiled. All of the details of this assassination attempt and its failure are written down in the annals of the king, okay? And it's pronounced annals. Uh, this will prove to be important later on in the story. Now, after all these events, there's a new rising star in the palace of the king. This official has been promoted and promoted left and right, and it is none other than the vile Haman. Every good story, there's a bad guy. And Haman is an advisor to Xerxes. He's the chief advisor. If Esther was a Disney movie, and it kind of reads like a Disney story, Haman was Jafar. Okay, he was Scar, he was Gaston. And one day Haman goes into the courtyard and everybody in the courtyard bows down to him. Everyone except Mordecai. This of course makes Haman very angry and upset. He's an angry man and he's full of pride. Uh, he gets so mad at Mordecai that he becomes so filled with rage that he wants to murder him, but not just murder him, but his entire family, and not just his entire family, his entire race. So then he creates this edict to annihilate the Jews, and the king signs it with his signet ring. And it came the day before Passover, which was the Jewish holiday that celebrated God's deliverance from their enemies. And now there's an edict to kill all the Jews in the empire. Where was God now? And at this, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on ashes and sackcloth as a symbol of mourning. And now he's on the run. He's in utter distress. His weeping is known throughout the palace guard. And Esther hears of the only father that she has ever known, crying, weeping, mourning. She immediately sends a messenger to find out why he is so downtrodden. Mordecai and Esther then begin to communicate through the king's eunuch, sending secret messages back and forth. He tells Esther everything and begs her to go before the king and beg for mercy on her people. She says, if I go before the king without being summoned, the penalty is death, okay? The only way I'll survive is if the king extends his royal scepter and I touch it. That's the only way I get pardoned. And just so you know, that's never been done before. There's no record in all of ancient history of someone touching the king's royal scepter. Mordecai responds with the most famous line from the book, Esther chapter 4, 13 and 14. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. This is your moment, Esther. This is why you're the queen. This is why you live in a palace. This is why you've been given such influence, not for your own comfort, but for the comfort and blessing of others. You are the queen for such a time as this. Like the Kelly Clarkson song from the first American Idol way back in 2002, some people wait a lifetime for a moment like this. This is her moment. What does Esther do? She replies, gather all the Jewish people in the city of Susa. Fast for me for three days. In me and my attendants, we will do the same. Then I will enter the king's chambers. And if I perish, I perish. That's probably the second greatest line in the book of Esther. If I perish, I perish. Wow, what courage, what bravery. For such a time as this, this moment isn't about feasting, it's about fasting. And it's the turning point in the story. And after three days, it is now time. Esther looks in the mirror and she gets ready. Hunched over, looking into the glass, contemplating if this is the last time she will ever see the light of day. When the moment arrived, she rushes to the throne room. At the risk of her own life, she approaches the king. The king is then pleased to see her and he extends the gold scepter, something that had never been done before. She boldly steps before the king with, without his request and he grants mercy. To the shock and awe of the onlookers, he extends his scepter. He says to her, Esther, my queen, whatever you want, even if it is up to half the kingdom, it's yours. Here is her moment. She's, some people wait a lifetime for a moment like this. She needs to oust Haman. And Esther says, my request is, and then she pauses. She stops. Something holds her back. This is the moment. This is the time. But something makes her hesitate. And she says, my request is, I would like to have dinner with you and with Haman tomorrow. Why did she pause? This was the moment. Why did she not reveal her purpose? Because timing is everything. God doesn't just want us to do the right thing. He wants us to do the right thing in the right time. God often pauses before he produces. For many of us, we think that when God pauses on something in our lives, that he stopped with something in our lives. But the pause wasn't him stopping, the pause was him starting. In the story of Esther, God is not winding down, he's warming up. Because Esther pauses, it causes Haman to leave that dinner full of arrogance, full of pride. I get to have dinner with the king and the queen tomorrow. She specifically requested me. And yet, when he walks out of that courtyard, he sees Mordecai and he gets hot and bothered all over again. Haman goes home to his wife and he starts complaining. Yeah, the Queen Esther, she just barges in and she asks for dinner with me and the king. But then I see that Jewish man, Mordecai, again. And all the positive vibes just go out the window. He starts complaining to his wife. She starts complaining about him too. You know what his wife says? She says, you know what you should do is that you should construct a, a hangman's gallow, 70 feet tall, and then hang Mordecai on them. Do you know how angry and arrogant you have to be that you want to create a killing device that is 70 feet in the air? Haman does this. He builds a hangman's gallows 70 feet high. You remember the game Hangman? where you guess a mystery word by choosing letters and with each failed guess, more of the person is hanging from a noose. Okay, I never realized how dark and morbid this game is. 
Haman here constructs the gallows for Mordecai. All because Esther paused. And because Esther paused, it caused King Xerxes to go home and toss and turn in his bed. He lies awake in his room, waiting to sleep, trying to sleep. He's taking his Ambien. He's taking his Tylenol PM. He's taking his Unisom and NyQuil, but everything he has tried has not helped. He's wide awake in the middle of the night. So being the narcissistic king that he is, he calls in some of his servants to read stories about himself. Oh, Jeeves, Jeeves, we grab that giant book over there and read to me from the annals of the king. So the servant begins reading and by chance, he opens to the page of, and reads the part where this official named Mordecai foils an assassination attempt against the king. The king says, stop. What was done for this Mordecai for saving the king's life? The servant says, actually nothing was done. The king ponders this and he eventually falls asleep. The next morning is the day of reckoning. Can you feel the anticipation? Can you see how things begin to line up? Haman wakes up and he makes his way to the palace. He's immediately summoned by the king and he approaches the king. The king declares, what should be done for the man that the king delights to honor? Now Haman thinks that the king is referring to himself. So he says, well, let the king place his robe upon him, parade him around on the king's horses throughout the city. Let all the people declare around him, this is what is done for the man whom the king delights to honor. The king says, wonderful, great idea. Go immediately, get Mordecai the Jew and bring him this honor. Now, in ancient Persia, it was illegal to frown in front of the king, okay? You couldn't like show any kind of gloom on your face. You couldn't show a face of sadness before the king or you'd be killed. So Haman put on his happy face when he hears that he is going to parade around his hated rival Mordecai all around town on the king's horse in the king's robe. I wish I could have seen his face. Now, Haman's fortunes suddenly turn. He finds himself bestowing honor on Mordecai, the one person that, who has refused to honor him. So he parades his rival around town and it's beyond awful for him. Do you see the irony here? Because Esther paused, it caused Haman, the hater of Mordecai, to become Haman, the celebrator of Mordecai. When God pauses, he turns haters into celebrators. Esther paused and followed the spirit and it led to the honor of the person she loved most in this life. Coincidence is a miracle in which God prefers to remain anonymous. Would the results be the same had she not fasted for three days? Was she perhaps more in tune with the Spirit's voice because she was relying on God's strength, not her own? One thing I see in the book of Esther, and I have seen this in my own life as well, is that God moves slow fast. Some of us need to hear that in this season. God moves slow fast. Esther one through four, nine year process, okay, nine years. Yet when the turnaround begins, God moves in sudden ways. Chapters five, six, seven, and eight, it's a 24 hour period. God moves slow fast. It's a lot like the 2020 divisional playoff game between the Houston Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, I know you're thinking that I'm just trying to talk about the Chiefs. I promise this is relevant, okay? Stick with me. The Chiefs were down 24 to zero in the second quarter, okay? It felt like nine years. Then the Lord began to move, okay? A kickoff return by McCole Hardman. A fourth down tackle by Daniel Sorensen. Then a forced fumble in return by Darwin Thompson. And then the magic of Patrick LeVon Mahomes. Within 10 minutes, 
the Chiefs scored 28 points and had the lead before halftime. There is a suddenness to the movement of God. Can I get an amen? God is slow, fast. For some of us, we believe that we are in a season of slow. Well, when is God going to move fast? When does God move suddenly? God moves suddenly when things are ready. So for some of us, that's what God needs, wants to say to us today. On your run, on your drive, on your couch, in your office chair, God moves suddenly when things are ready. Back to Esther. So Haman is humiliated. But at least he still has Esther's party that she's throwing for just him and the king later on. And when he arrives, the king demands the queen, Queen Esther. What do you want? Whatever it is, it's yours, even up to half the kingdom. This is her moment. Some people wait a lifetime for a moment like this. She says, grant me my life and the life of my people. The king is immediately thinking, who would want to kill the queen? Whoever it is, he's a dead man. Who is it? Tell me. Esther replies, an adversary, an enemy. It is that vile Haman. And to fulfill the irony, Haman was hung on the gallows that he had built for, wait for it, Mordecai. <laughs> Esther is the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God even once. And yet, as you heard the story, could you not see God at work in delivering his people? Mordecai raising his cousin. Esther keeping her identity quiet until the perfect moment. The favor Esther receives from the harem and from the king. The sleepless night of the king that led to the honoring of Mordecai and the building of the gallows by Haman, which would eventually be his own demise. Coincidence is a miracle in which God prefers to remain anonymous. There is certainly plenty of irony, isn't there? Yet God is absent and silent. Does anybody need to know that even when God seems silent, he's still in control? That even when there are mean, impulsive, narcissistic people around us, God can still move. Perhaps some of us need to be assured that God is slow fast. You know, Jesus was slow fast. He lived 33 years, 30 years before he even begins his ministry. That's slow. Three years of ministry. He dies on the cross. There is a pause. And then there is suddenness. Here comes the turnaround with the resurrection. Are you in need of a turnaround in your life today? Are, are you in a season of slow? Buckle up because God is slow fast and the turnaround is just around the corner. Let's put our faith and trust in him this Mother's Day and let's just see what happens. God, I pray in Jesus' name that we put our trust in you. We thank you for the example of Queen Esther, this woman of courage, of, of bravery, of faith, and of faithfulness. God, thank you that you have called us to our homes, to our work, to our jobs, to our city, to this church for such a time as this. God, let us take these moments, every moment, in the way that you want us to, God, to live into it, to lean into it, to love into it. We need you in Jesus' name, amen. We wanna thank you so much for joining us online at prodigalchurchfresno.com. If it, today is Mother's Day, so if you are watching this early before 10 a.m., come on over to Bullard High School Theater. We've got some fun stuff planned and a free gift for all the women today. We hope you have an amazing week. Grace and peace. Thank <laughs> you.